Hello, welcome to Terrain Gospel Ministries. My name is Terry LaSalle, and I'd like to do part two of our Bible study on dying to self. This part is entitled The Two Ditches. We're going to do it in two parts. This will be part 2a. But just a bit of a review. In part one, we talked about the three types of death. The first being spiritual, the second being physical death, and the third one being basically the topic of the study of dying to self. This dying to self is choosing to obey the word of God, to resist sin, to put down our desires, to set aside our wants, to give up our comforts, cancel our agendas, crucify our flesh daily, and live differently than the world does. This is with the way the Bible says to live as a Christian. But many modern day Christians will argue this. But nevertheless, we are called to live as moral, godly, and holy people. Let's look at these scriptures. Galatians 5.24 Those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Titus 2.12 says that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Hebrews 12.14 Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Leviticus 20.26 20, And you shall be holy to me, for I the Lord am holy, and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. And 2 Corinthians 6.17 <clears throat> Excuse me. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Obviously, the Bible calls us to be separate from the world. John 17 says, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. And in John 12, it says we are to hate our lives in this world in order to gain eternal life. Now, this is difficult to do, and I know this. There's no, there's no pill, no video, no course. And there's no book you can read to become a better you. Contrary to what Joel Osteen says, Christianity has never been about looking deep inside yourself to become a better you. Never. It's actually about dying to yourself to become like Christ. That's what Christianity is about. And contrary to Rick Warren, it's not about a purpose-driven life. It's about a spirit-led life. So don't listen to these guys who are false teachers that tell you something that will not ever allow you the opportunity to come into the presence of God in the way he tells us to do it. Christian living requires discipline and obedience to the word of God and yielding to the leading and the correction of the Holy Spirit to live as a follower of Christ in this ungodly world. It requires choosing to reject the broad ways of the world and choosing to select the narrow way of Christ. The whole purpose of doing this study, this part 2a, is to talk about this narrow road, this narrow way that Jesus teaches, and to examine the two ditches that lie on each side of this narrow road. And these ditches form that wide road of destruction. Matthew 7.13 says this, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. I find that very sobering. This, there's a few very sobering, actually frightening statements in the Bible, and this is one of them. It says, few will find the narrow way which leads to life. Few will find it. And yet, in spite of this frightful warning of Jesus, many Christians can and do live on either side of that narrow road that he talks about. One is the ditch of legalism, which is, which is what we're going to basically dwell on today. And it's, it's long, and I understand this. This is a long video, but I want to look at it from two perspectives. The, the ditch of legalism is very cold and stiff and unloving, just like the Pharisees in the Bible. And the other ditch, which we'll talk about in part 2b, is a ditch of liberalism, which is totally relaxed, carnal, and living like the world. Let's look at legalism. And let's look at these two ditches. It's, it's similar to a road that we drive on with our cars. And there's a ditch in each side of the road. There's no names in those ditches, but it's basically a ditch. They have never been designed to drive in. Pretty simple. You will wreck your car if you drive in those ditches. The road has been where you have been what that has been designed for you to drive your car on. And should you choose to drive down either ditch, you're going to wreck your car. It's pretty simple. 
Well, there's two ditches in Christianity as well. One is called legalism and one is called liberalism. And basically, just the same as wrecking your car driving down a ditch, if you choose to live your life in one of these two ditches, liberalism or legalism, you will wreck your life as a Christian as well. And in this part 2A here, I want to talk and look and focus on this ditch of legalism. Legalism, and, and I want out there's going to be a lot of scriptures and basically just a lot of explanations about this that I've looked up and researched and, and, and wanted to share this with you to give you a better understanding of what it is and hopefully recognize if you're in it, get out. And if you have friends that are in it, help them get out as well and pray for them. Legalism or nominism or nomism, excuse me, in Christian theology is the act of putting the law of Moses above the gospel by establishing requirements for salvation beyond repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. These legalistic requirements were an exclusive set of very rigid laws and moral codes. Legalists follow these codes with an overemphasis on discipline of conduct, misguided zeal, pride, self-righteousness, false humility, and an air of deep piousness and spirituality. Know anybody like that? The letter of the law is applied without mercy, in ignorance of the grace of God, and with little or no regard to the Holy Spirit. Legalism can be thought of as any works-based religious practice that states salvation and right standing with God come strictly from adherence to the rules of doctrinal law. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes in the Bible were true legalists because they emphasized obeying the law of Moses to the letter <clears throat> without understanding the concept of grace. These people love the praises of men for their strict adherence to the law. But Jesus condemned these guys with very strong language in Matthew 23. And for I'm not worried about time here, but let's just read the most of Matthew 23 here. And I've done it in the Amplified Version of the Bible, which is a little long and choppy, but it brings out everything that needs to be said, I believe. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees have seated themselves in Moses' chair of authority as teachers of the law. So practice and observe everything they tell you, but do not do as they do. For they preach things, but do not practice them. The scribes and the Pharisees tie up heavy loads, that are hard to bear and place them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not lift a finger to make them lighter. They do all their deeds to be seen by men, for they make their phylacteries, which is that leather box that sat on the front of their heads. You can read about it in Deuteronomy, I believe. It's where they wrote a piece of scripture and put it inside there. They make them wide to make them more conspicuous, and they make the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of distinction and honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogue, those on the platform near the scrolls of the law, facing the congregation, and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and the public forums, and to have people call them rabbi. Jesus says this right here, Do not be called rabbi, teacher, for one, capital O, is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all equally brothers. Do not call anyone on earth, listen to this, do not call anyone on earth who guides you spiritually your father. For one is your father, he who is in heaven. Now, I don't know how the Catholic Church came up with their whole program of calling people father and can get away from this scripture. Do not let yourselves be called leaders or teachers. For one is your leader, teacher, the Christ. But the greatest among you will be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And then we move into these things called the woes. And the word woe that I've looked up is means impending doom. Judgment is coming. Verse 13, But woe, judgment is coming to you, self-righteous scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. The word hypocrite in Greek, hypo, hypocrites, hypocritos, it means play acting, play acting. You're acting out the part, but you're not really living the part. You yourselves do not enter, nor do you allow those who are in the process of entering to do so. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you swallow up widows' houses, and to cover it up, you make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive the greater condemnation. 
Woe to you, self-righteous scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel over sea and land to make a single proselyte or a convert to Judaism. And when he becomes a convert, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Strong words. Woe to you, self-righteous scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you give a tenth, which is the tithe, of your mint and dill and cumin, focusing on minor matters, and have neglected the weightier, more important moral and spiritual provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the primary things you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You spiritually blind guides who strain out a gnat, consuming yourselves with minuscule matters, and swallow a camel, ignoring and violating God's precepts. Woe to you, self-righteous scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and of the plate, but inside they are full of extortion and robbery and self-indulgence, unrestrained greed. You spiritually blind guides, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate. Examine and change your inner self to conform to God's precepts, so that the outside, your public life and deeds, may be clean also. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. And you say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have joined them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then and complete what your ancestors started. You serpents, you spawn of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? And this is Jesus talking. These are the words in red. This is Jesus speaking in Matthew 23 to the leaders of the church, Pharisees, hypocrites, total legalists. These are terribly condemning words, indictment, quite frankly, by Jesus. Why? Because legalism is totally about keeping the law, while the kingdom of God is about grace and truth, which came through Jesus Christ. And legalism was also a system used to judge who is worthy and who is not of God's attention. This is brought out in Luke 18, again in the Amplified Bible. This is the one about the Pharisee and the tax collector standing in the temple. Jesus also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves and were confident that they were righteous, posing outwardly as upright and in right standing with God, and he who viewed others with contempt. He said this, Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, Pharisee stood ostentatiously, and began praying to himself in a self-righteous way, saying, God, I thank you that I am not like the rest of men, swindlers, unjust, dishonest, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I, pray tithe, I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing at a distance, would not even raise his eyes towards heaven but was striking his chest in humility and repentance, saying, God, be merciful and gracious to me, the especially wicked sinner that I am. Verse 14 says, Jesus speaking, I tell you this, I tell you, this man went to his home justified, forgiven of the guilt of sin and placed in right standing with God, rather than the other man. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself, forsaking self-righteous pride, will be exalted. Again, very powerful words of Jesus. Believers today can be legalistic as well. And it, it's, it's a very poor form of Christianity. Let's look at it. This modern day legalism uses the same system that that Pharisee did in judging who is worthy before God. Still used today. A few more explanations here. The word legalism does not occur in the Bible. But that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. The word Trinity doesn't uh, occur in the Bible. Neither does the word rapture occur in the Bible. But we know that they exist. Legalism is a term Christians use to describe a doctrinal position emphasizing a system of rules and regulations for achieving both salvation and spiritual growth. Legalists believe in and demand a strict literal adherence to rules and regulations. 
Doctrinally, it is a position essentially opposed to grace. Those who hold a legalistic position often fail to see the real purpose for the law, especially the purpose of the Old Testament law of Moses, which is to be our schoolmaster or our tutor to bring us to Christ. That's mentioned in Galatians 3.24. Even true believers can be harshly legalistic, even though the Bible instructs us to be gracious to one another. Romans 14 and 1 says, Accept him who is weak in the faith, without passing judgment on disputable matters. Sadly, there are those who feel so strongly about non-essential doctrines that they will run others out of their fellowship and even out of their life, not even allowing the expression of another viewpoint. Many legalistic believers today make the error of demanding unqualified adherence to their own biblical interpretation and even to their own denominational traditions. For example, to be spiritual, one must be totally want to be spiritual. One must totally abstain from tobacco, alcohol, dancing, movies, working on Sunday, etc., etc., etc. The truth is that although this might not, this may. The truth is that although it may. be a good thing to avoid such habitual practices. And we're going to talk about that when we get to part three of this whole study. Doing so is no guarantee of spirituality. It might be a good thing not to drink, not to smoke, not to watch movies, not to spend all your time on the tube or Facebook or something. That doesn't make you spiritual. It doesn't do anything. It's not a guarantee of spirituality. Legalists may appear to be righteous and very spiritual, but legalism ultimately fails to accomplish God's purposes because it is, out, because it is an outward performance instead of an inward change. The Apostle Paul warns us of legalism in Colossians 2, 20-23. Let's read this. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of the world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all designed to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Have you ever found yourself sounding like a Pharisee? God, I thank you that I'm not like the other men especially like this tax collector. I always fast and pray, read the Bible, go to church, tithe, etc., 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 blah, 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 ad nauseum. You find yourself directing others doing this. Maybe sound something like this. You just have to follow the rules. Look at, see, it's written right there in the Bible. God says what he wants us to do and what he wants us not to do. It's pretty clear. That's how you please him, isn't it? It's really just black and white. How hard can that be to figure out? God made it that simple, so just do it. And even if you don't want to, you don't have to like it. The love and the joy comes from obedience and sacrifice, knowing that you're pleasing Him. Just do it. And people get confused in what they think you're supposed to do and all of that stuff. And I remember when I first came back to the Lord, I was a prodigal son. Someday I'll tell my testimony. But when I first came back to the Lord, and, and, and I believe the Lord called me to this Pentecostal church, I went to the Pentecostal church, and these two very pious people came to me and said something about, you know, would you like to come for lunch? And I said, no, no, I'm great. I've got supper going at home there. We've got a roast of pork in the oven, and I really like roast pork. I said, well, if you understood the Bible, you would realize that you couldn't eat pork. I said, well, if you read the Bible, you realize we're not Jewish. We've been free, freed from that law. And that's how stupid it gets, and to adhere to some kind of law, and it messes up young Christians greatly. It's so stupid. And then they get all legalistic. Just follow the rules. Just do it like I just read. It's, it's totally stupid. Listen, imagine a marriage like this. Here's a little dialogue. Good morning, dear. Coffee, please. Thank you. I'm going to work now so I can pay the mortgage, the utilities, the car payment, the insurance, etc., etc., etc. It is my duty as the head of the household. Here's your list of chores. Please ensure that they're all done today. Thank you. I'm so glad we're married. I will let you know later what I want for supper. Have a nice day. I love you. That would be a lovely marriage now, wouldn't it? You see, Christ calls us his bride, but this is what the Pharisees acted like to God. Just like that sad marriage 
comment that I just made. Just rules and service. No love, no joy, no future. Just rules. We have a dear friend, Mary. You can see her testimony on her on her YouTube channel. And she, I loved her expression about this. She says, how's that working out for you? It won't work out well for you at all. And so the conclusion to this whole legalism and Phariseeism is a very harsh and destructive ditch, both for the legalist and for those around him. And if you find yourself in this, just strictly following rules, maybe you've been just duped, led there, I don't know. But what I am telling you is that you need to get out. And, and, and if you're doing this because you really want to, because you love the whole power of it, and the whole false humility, and the whole piousness, and the whole people look up to you because of that, you need to repent of that, because that's not Jesus at all. Ask forgiveness and ask God to change you. Because it is a, an extremely dangerous ditch to be in, an extremely dangerous ditch to be in. It will ruin you and it will ruin people around you. Now with all that said, I need to look at something that's really true Christianity. This whole dying to self and the purpose of this portion of this uh, topic of the Bible study here is to understand that dying to self is not legalism. It's, it's true Christianity. Giving up your life here, dying as with Christ, and living a life he calls us to do here is not going to be accepted. It's going to be called legalistic. In part one of the study, I ended with this. Choosing to die to self and live on the narrow path as Jesus tells us to do will cause mocking and scorning. Many will use the terms dogmatic, stiff, legalistic. Sadly, even church folk will use that. Primarily because the compromised church of today has adopted a comfortable, politically correct, liberal point of view on how the Christian should live and speak. Consequently, should you decide to live and speak on the side of biblical truth, dying to self, giving up your life, holy, righteous, godly in this present world, you will quickly be rejected and labeled a legalist or a Pharisee. Excuse me. Jesus said a disciple of his will be hated. And, and, and as a result of that thought, I need to add a word of caution here, okay? It's very necessary. Dying to self and living for Christ is not legalism, but the constant criticism, rejection, and even hatred we face about it may cause us to become timid and withdrawn about openly living and speaking out our Christianity. Be careful. Don't let the trouble that comes deter you. Continue to live fully for Jesus, following the principles of his word, and speak the truth in love, but speak the truth. There are too many people today that are falling away in this present day and age. Too much emergent church, too much softening of the gospel, too much saying, well, Jesus didn't really mean this and Jesus didn't really mean that. And if you speak that way, you're just legalistic, you're uncaring, you're unloving, you're hateful. And that's the caution we need to make because when people call us legalistic or stiff, we need to say, no, this is Bible and what you're saying is wrong. And you need to stick to your guns, as they say, and continue to do this. God will honor you for that. But you need to do this and not be pushed off your mark here. I just want to look at this area of being legalistic or judgmental for speaking the word. <clears throat> today we live in a society in it we today we live in a society where everyone does what is right in his own eyes. Everybody is doing, the church is doing what is right in their own eyes. They're following these false preachers and prophets, the money preachers, the, the kingdom now guys, the replacement theology guys, the emergent church guys, and women. And they're following them and they're just doing what is right in their own eyes. They're listening to false teaching. They're setting the Bible on the shelf, cherry picking out of it what they want. It's not a buffet, folks. It's not a buffet. It's the whole counsel of God. You've got to eat what's on your plate. That's how it works with, with him. Judges 21, 25, everyone doing what is right in their own eyes. That didn't work well for Israel. If you read about it, that didn't work well for Israel. People insist that there are no moral absolutes. Each man should decide for himself what is right and wrong. And we should tolerate 
which in their, their minds, which means celebrate sinful activities. Talk of sin is frowned upon. The Bible says in the last days there will be a great falling away from the things of God. And the church of today is doing just that. Rapidly embracing the world's views, succumbing to the pressure of political correctness, turning away from God and the Bible and becoming ap apostate. Quite frankly, even heretical. Many pastors avoid making statements that could be seen as remotely condemning or reproachful. The wisdom preached from many pulpits today is that to speak up about or take a stand against certain controversial activities in either society or the church is basically unkind or unloving and therefore it has to be ungodly. However, what is socially acceptable is not always biblically acceptable. And the issue of loving someone doesn't have anything to do with whether or not that person's behavior is acceptable to God. If we love them, we'll tell them that it is not acceptable to God. If we love them we will enough, we will tell them that the path they're on will lead to destruction. Wide is the gate and broad is the path that leads to destruction and many find it. If we love them, we will tell them that the way they're living, the, the activities they're, they're, they're engaging in as a Christian are not on the narrow path that Jesus set. If we love them enough, we'll remind them that in spite of all they think they're doing as a Christian, Matthew 7, 21 says, many are going to come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, have I not done all these great things in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. That's the other most terrifying scripture in the Bible. Although socially acceptable, the activity may well be sin. And sin cannot be disregarded as a Christian. Regardless of what the world or the lukewarm church thinks, you can read about the lukewarm church in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 20. Laodicea. God is still very serious about sin. In fact, he hates it. Read about it in the Bible. And he must judge it because he is holy. And he instructs us as followers of Christ not to condone sin, but to boldly speak up about it and expose it. Ephesians 5, 8 to 12 reads this. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk then as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. Now listen closely here. Opposing and exposing sin is not wrong. In fact, holding aloft the standard of righteousness naturally defines unrighteousness and draws the hatred and rejection of those who choose sin over godliness. Shining a bright light always exposes the things hidden in darkness. That's what Jesus said people are condemned. Why? Because light has come into the world. John 3, 17 to 19. Light has come into the world, but men love the darkness rather than the light. Their deeds were evil, and they love the darkness rather than the light. All of this, you know, it's like... We've all done this as kids, out in the field, pull over a rock, roll over a log, and all those little squirmy things, all that are under that in the darkness, all scurry away. Why? Because they've been exposed to the light, and they can't live in the light. They need to live in the darkness. Christians who shine the light of the Bible into people's lives and dare speak out against behaviors and lifestyles that God declares as sinful are often shunned and labeled as intolerant, judgmental, religious fanatics who are always imposing their dogmatic views on others. In all of this, it is important to allow the Bible, now listen, and the Bible alone, not my idea, not your idea, what's right and wrong. My idea of something and your idea of something is maybe totally different, depending on all sorts of things and reasons and backgrounds and whatever. Only the Bible is to define sin. It, it, God's made it pretty simple. He's given us the standard. For everyone. Not your standard, my standard, someone in another country standard. The standard. 
He's made it extremely simple. The standard of the Bible is what we're supposed to follow. Use the Bible to define sin and righteousness. Our opinions are irrelevant. But if the Bible says something is sin, then no amount of pressure from society or worldly wisdom or personal experience should make us say anything different. Truth is truth, no matter what anyone says or how anyone feels. While we need to be gracious to one another and tolerant of disagreement over disputable matters, we cannot accept heresy. Reads that in Jude chapter 3. We are exhorted to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. We cannot be afraid of speaking up about sin and apostasy in the church. God calls us to do this. Listen to this from 1 John 4 and 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. The Apostle Paul also found him all often found himself in trouble for speaking the truth about Christ's salvation and exposing the false doctrines and teachers. He wrote about them. Alexander, Hymenaeus, Alexander the coppersmith, Philetus, I believe. He was called many things and thought of as a great troublemaker. But in his final epistle, his letter to Timothy, just before he was going to die, he instructed Timothy with this wisdom. Listen, Timothy, a, a servant of the Lord, 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. Do it in love, do it in humility. Don't poke your finger in someone's eye, but point out to them, correcting them to say, that you're in opposition of God and you're on the wrong side of the Bible. And you need to come back because otherwise you're in a perilous place. One last thing here. God gave us the word for teaching, training, and the correction of error. All scripture, 2 Timothy again, chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is God-breathed, again from the Amplified, given by divine inspiration and is profitable for instruction for conviction of sin, for correction of error and restoration to obedience, for training in righteousness, which is learning to live in conformity to God's will, both publicly and privately, behaving honorably with personal integrity, integrity and moral courage. It's one thing to be a Christian on Sunday. You need to be a Christian on Monday, at work, at home, with your wife, when your wife is not there, with your phone, with your internet. You need to be a Christian publicly and privately. But when you start doing this and using the word of God for correction to someone that you know is living on the wrong side of it, you'll be called judgmental. The one scripture that everyone out there knows today, even the atheist knows this. Matthew 7 and 1 says this, Judge not lest ye be, dud, lest ye be judged. Maybe you've heard this when you've tried to talk to someone. It's the first thing anyone says when you point out a sin or a problem. Don't judge me. Who are you to judge me? Now, they may be justified in saying this. There's two areas of error that we can be in as Christians when we go to correct someone. Jesus pointed this out. The first one is this. Although we are not to agree or accept the sinful conditions and lifestyles of the world, we are not to judge the people of the world. Okay? They will be judged by God. We are not to judge the people of the world. Jesus said that again, the word, in the word, that they will be judged by the word. John 12 reads this, verse 46 to 50. I have come as a light into the world, Jesus speaking, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe them, I do not judge them. Jesus speaking, I do not judge them, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him, the word. However, we are to judge the church. 1 Corinthians 5 
12 to 13 says this. For what business is, is it of mine to judge others, outsiders, non-believers? Again, the Amplified. Do you not judge those who are within the church to protect the church as the situation requires? See, the problem with the church today is that too many Christians have been muzzled to say that's and frightened to speak up. And when they speak up to something to their pastor, to their fellow members of the church, they get ostracized, they get deemed as legalist, and they end up eventually leaving. The pastors don't want the trouble. The people are just like, don't judge me. But we're supposed to, to protect the church and to protect the body of Christ. Verse 13 says, God alone sits in judgment on those who are outside the faith. But we are supposed to remove the wicked one from among you and expel him from your church. Instead, we condone sin within the church. We condone sin within the body of Christ and call it okay. And we're unwilling for many reasons. One of it is being thought of as legalistic or judgmental. Or we just don't want the trouble. Even though Jesus says, you'll, you'll find lots of trouble if you want to live for me. Paul says, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven without much tribulation. But in order to do this, we must be living properly, soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. We can't be living a haphazard, loose lifestyle as a Christian at home or in public and then go to church on Sunday or call up our friend or see them doing something and saying, hey, that's wrong. He tells us about this. He said, test in about 2 Corinthians, test and evaluate yourselves to see whether you are in the faith and living your lives as committed believers. Examine yourselves, not me. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves by an ongoing experience that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test and are rejected as counterfeit? Those are strong words. We have to examine ourselves. Am I in the faith? Every day, every day, every day. Dying to self is every day. Dying to self is crucifying your flesh every day. Dying to self is, is examining yourself and saying, God, change me, help me, please. I need to be like you. That's what. And I need your power to do it. And if you're living with unrepentant sin, if you have a pet sin, a favorite habit, nobody knows. Maybe it's on your phone. That's unrepentant sin. And should you choose to judge someone else while you have this unrepentant sin, you will be a hypocrite and you will be judged by God for it. Matthew 7, 1 to 5 says this, in the Amplified again, do not judge and criticize and condemn others unfairly with an attitude of self-righteousness, superiority, as though assuming the office of a judge so that you will not be judged. The world uses this all the time, but Jesus really spoke this to us. Don't judge and criticize and condemn others unfairly so that you will not be judged. For just as you hypocritically judge others when you are sinful and unrepentant, so you will be judged. And in accordance with your standard of measure used to pass out judgment, judgment will be measured to you. Luke 6, 37 to 42 says, Do not, again, the same one, do not judge others self-righteously and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others when you are guilty or unrepentant. And you will not be condemned by your hypocrisy. Pardon others when they truly repent and change and you will be pardoned when you truly repent and change. And then he goes on to talk about the speck in your eye. That's the other one we used to use all the time. I, was, I did it myself. Don't judge me. Look at the speck in your eye. You know, Look at the big log in your eye. I had a plank sticking out of mine. I thought it was a speck. But listen, why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you do not notice or consider the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, allow me to take the speck out that is in your eye, <clears throat> when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite, play actor, pretender. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck that is in your brother's eye. We must die to self, get out of the things of the world, live a holy and righteous and godly life before God, 
then we will be able to use the word of God to help others come out of the sins that they may be in as well. But we can't do it while we have unrepentant sin. Now listen, this is not a prohibition of judgment, nor is it a command to stop using godly wisdom, common sense, and moral courage, together with God's written word, to discern right from wrong, to distinguish between morality and immorality, and to judge doctrinal truth. There are many judgments that are not only legitimate, but are commanded. However, you cannot judge another if you are committing the same type of sin. That really only makes sense. That really only makes sense. Do not judge by appearance superficially and arrogantly, but judge fairly and righteously. John 7, 24. I'll just end with this. As we instruct and confront others, let us do so gently, but with kindness to everyone. We will be called judgmental and legalistic. Yes, we will. But if we speak the truth of the word with Christ's love and mercy, we will be safe from both legalism and heresy. You can't live in the ditch of legalism because you'll wreck your life. You can't keep unrepented sin in your life and cover it up and think you're okay. How do you hide anything from God? So confess it. Be clean of that. Be washed every day. Come to him. 1 John 1 and 9. If we confess our faults to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what we must do to live in this dying to self life. We cannot be afraid of speaking up about the truth of God for fear of being called legalistic. We will be called legalistic, just get it. We will be called legalistic and all those other things that we just talked about. But we must speak the truth. We must speak up for what the Bible says, the whole counsel of God. And I'll tell you why, because very few people are doing that today. Very few people have caved in to the pressure of society and political correctness to say we can't say that anymore, that's just not right. And as a result, people are going down paths that are going to lead to destruction. And we're letting them go. We'll be held, will we be held res responsible for that? We'll leave that up to God. But I know what he tells us to do. And that's what we just talked about. So don't live in that ditch of legalism. Get out of it. It's stiff, cold, callous, unloving. By the letter of the law. And the Bible says the letter of the law killeth. But the spirit of God gives life. And so get out of that ditch if you're in it. Ask God to help you. Don't be so stiff. Don't let past religious denominational practices guide what the way you're supposed to live. Let the Bible do it and, and be led by the Spirit of God. You can relax a little from this pious, rigid, rule-driven life of legalism. You have to. You have to. And when you do, don't be afraid to stand up for the word of God, even though you are called legalistic. Because you must do that according to what God said. Expose the unfruitful works of darkness. Let's, let's pray, and then I'll just introduce what's coming up next. But let's, let's pray. Father, we just give you thanks and praise, Lord, for this time. Lord... Help us to better understand these two ditches and help us to better understand the narrow road. Give us all, Lord, the grace and the ability to die to ourselves. Help us, Lord, to give up our own agendas. Help us, Lord, not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Help us, Lord, and open up our spirits to receive your word that would change us on the inside. Help us to be free from the bondage and the chains, Lord of legalism and denominationalism and those things, Lord, that, that grip us and hold us in a grip of fear even. And Lord, we thank you. And help us to speak up. Give us the courage to speak up. Give us the courage that you did with the first church to speak up, Lord, for what's right and wrong, to speak up what the Bible says, to be counted among those 
that are willing, Lord, to do that. We thank you for it, Lord. We ask you to help us in Jesus' name. Listen, if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you don't know what this is about, if you've never taken the step <laughs> towards Christ to, to have a life, don't be afraid of being a legalist. God will help you. God will help you. But the first step you need to make is believing on him and coming out of the world, asking him to forgive you of your sins and being saved. You must be saved. Jesus said you must be born again. Look around you in this world. It's changing fast. And it's not getting better. And there's things coming that you're going to need to be able to face as a Christian and not as a non-believer. It's as simple as turning to Christ, calling upon him, asking him to forgive you, asking him to save you. Be sincere about it. Open your heart to him. You must have him forgive you of your sins. You can't do it yourself. So if you would do that, call upon the Lord and you will be saved and you will enter this life. You will enter this as a new creation and be prepared for those days that are ahead. Please do that today. Please turn to Christ and be saved. In the next study coming up, it'll be a part 2B, but we will talk about a very dangerous ditch, the other ditch of this. Legalism is bad. It's bad and destructive, but I think this ditch that's coming up is the ditch of today. It's the ditch that most people are falling into. I think it's the most destructive ditch of all, and that's the ditch of legalism. Uh excuse me, liberalism. That's the ditch of liberalism. And I think it's a terrible thing that's creeping into the church today. So I invite you to join me again for part 2B of the two ditches, and that will be legalism. God bless you, and thank you for listening.